Hey everybody, welcome to the Faith Church Podcast. I am your host, Jay Williams, and joining me today is Jeff Clossy. Hey, good morning, Jay. I feel like this is episode one. It is, we're starting fresh. Starting, we, we've been gone. I don't remember, I mean, I've been away from this for weeks. Yeah, I, I think Months, it's been a few years. Weeks. All of our fans have been reaching out. Yes. Our listeners and saying, what is going on? It's been all over. All of my time has been spent responding to those inquiries. Yeah. So now I can move on to other things. A couple pre- Leslie's been fielding press release uh-huh. requests of... <laughs> Our PR firm's failing PR us firm miserably. Is like they, well, they're, they're struggling. They're <laughs> trying to keep their head above water. All the rumors swirling around. We're back. Yeah. It, it was a... It did feel... It's so interesting. It's such a great example of rhythms where once we, we took a break for Christmas... And then I was out in Colorado teaching and then it was like, it was just week by week. And so it's hard to get back into the rhythm of that. And so I knew when I asked you this week, I said, Hey, we need to record a podcast. And you gave me a look of like, okay. And I was like, no, it will be great. We need to get back into this because we have the I am series starting started this week. I'm like, this is a great time. And that is actually really exciting. It is exciting. So, um, so yeah, so we're back. And hopefully, hopefully we didn't lose all of our listeners. We'll, we'll find out. We will. We'll find out. We'll find out. It's a growing audience, Jay. So I think we'll. we'll... It's growing. It's growing by ones and ones and a half. I want to know. Still, we should do. A, it's too bad we can't do a poll. But somebody had told me once that they have to listen. They listen to the podcast on two speeds. Oh, really? Like two times? Well, no. Like. Oh, two different two different speeds, speeds while they're listening to us. Like they have to when it's me talking, they got to go regular speed, and when it's you talking, they can speed up, and then they go right, they have to go regular speed. Oh, my rate of speech being slower than mine. There's the contrast, yeah, between you and me. I think I say double the words in the amount of time than that you do. That could be someone should count that for us and send it in. We could wouldn't be that hard. We could transcript the whole thing, <laughs> and then we'd be like, "Wow, Jay." <laughs> It'd be like a football game, like time of possession. Who can fit the most words in in the least amount of time? It'd be time, time of possession versus yards. So the yards would be the number of words. Time of possession is how long you're speaking. Got the ball. I got the Run. Ball. Yeah. All right, great. Well, speaking of that. Well, so that was a good th- episode. That was. Oh, we're not did done. did a great job <laughs> jumping back in. We just, we just, we wanted to set the bar low, just get yeah. back in the saddle. Just give people something so, to download. Yep. So thanks for listening. I hope that it's been helpful. So I am. I am. You are? Uh-huh. It I is. like that your your comments about grammar. Yeah. On was Sunday, it, that I, was good. Okay, I got to be honest. I don't feel like that landed as well as I thought. That always bothered me growing up. Before Reading a, the Bible, <laughs> reading that statement, before I understood what the I am statements were. So you got to remember too, and I guess this is what I have to remember for everybody. I didn't grow up in a church that taught the Bible. So... I, when I was reading the Bible, I was kind of reading it on my own and trying to figure it out, which, you know, was, <laughs> had some hilarious results, but, but I remember reading this and thinking, I don't understand. Like, what am I missing here? Am I, you know, am I reading the sentence with the wrong cadence? Like, am I missing a punctuation? Am I missing something? But when Jesus says before Abraham was, I am, it drove me nuts. Yeah, because we would imagine he would say before Abraham was, I was. Right. I or was. Like, or, or I existed. I existed. <laughs> Something yeah. Something like that. But I yeah, existed say, before Abraham. I was around. Yes, I was around during that time. It's definitely jarring when you're reading it. It's, yeah. it, it and I think in a good way, because it, it's not just an everyday statement. It's one of the most radical statements that he made about himself. Yeah. And and once I realized that and learned that, I thought, oh, wow, this is so powerful. And you got to realize, too, I'm reading this. I don't have study Bibles. I don't mean that. I, yeah. have, have, I think it was an NRSV that I'm trying to figure out. And um, I think that – so it's a really powerful statement. And so we're, we're starting this series of the I am statements. And we were just actually talking about this before we went on the air that most scholars say that there are seven I am statements – and this one is not one of the ones they include in the seven, but you you were explaining the difference there. Do you want to share that with the nice people? Yeah, just that that the seven they they categorize as metaphorical. So like 
for example, one of them would be, I am the bread of life, which I get to preach on in a couple of weeks. And I'm really excited about that. Um, so it's a metaphorical statement about his identity that he's revealing. This one is, they would call an absolute statement about his identity. So he's just declaring, I am, I am the sovereign one overall. Yeah. And you had on the screen too, on the, the, a verse that the Exodus verse yeah. where God reveals himself as the I am. Yeah. And that's why this would have been so radical and why they're radical and why their response to it was so hostile. It, you know, it was obviously like you pointed out the claim that they weren't free was really insulting, but that, that was nothing compared to what he ended up saying when he said, I, I am. Right. Yeah. Because when he makes that statement, you know, Jesus, and he, we talked about this on Sunday that later they say, well, tell us plainly, like if you're the Christ and he's like, yeah, I've been, I've been telling you, been showing you if you, if you had ears to hear at all, basically, you know, if you have eyes to see, if you have any inkling here, you would, you'd already know you wouldn't need to ask this. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to get him to say something that, that they can, um, they, they're trying to catch him, right? They're trying to catch him in saying something that they, that's punishable, that they can arrest him for, that they can charge him with. Because up until that time, it's all kind of implied and he speaks in parables and he speaks in, you know, in, in these kind of roundabout ways because it wasn't the time yet. But then when he says this, when he says before Abraham was, I am, that is a clear, they, you know, they've got him. And it's hard to know, you know, on one hand you say, well, um, they're upset because of the blasphemy, but you know, I find a lot of times that kind of righteous indignation is not actually righteous. You know, like it's still self-serving. That's like like a means to an end, right? Right. Yeah. They're, they're upset about all the other things Jesus is saying, and now they have something to catch him on. And, and I see this today a lot where people are upset about, you know, something somebody's saying or whatever, but then if they, if you have the ability to cover your selfish indignation with something that appears righteous or holy or good, we do it all the time, right? Like we're, this is our culture right now. So I just don't like you, but if you say something that I can, that, so I can appear like I'm the just one, that I'm the good one, that I can paint you as the oppressor. I can paint you as um, as the, the evil one or whatever, then, then I'm good. And now that, but that's really just a cover for my own petty self-righteousness. Yeah. It's a lever you can pull to get the thing you want, you know, and this was kind of, I mean, the moment they were waiting for, right. Because this is the, this is the ultimate lever to pull. Like this man just said that he is the transcendent God of the universe. But what in the world, what are we going to do about that? Are we okay with that? Right. You know, which, like, so here's what's funny about that. Even the way he said it, though, was so clever in that it's revealing it to all the religious authorities, but Rome isn't going to care about that statement. And the, if if they went, if they go to Rome and they say, you got to do something about this because he thinks he's God. Oh, did he say that? Well, he said, I am. I am what? Like Ro- the, Rome, the Romans aren't going to understand that or care about that. And so... He's always speaking in ways that the people who, you know, he came for the Jews, like he came for God's people to reveal himself as the Messiah and then, and then for others and for the Gentiles as well. But first it was to the Jews. And so he's prophesying, he's telling them like when John the Baptist asks, are you the one or should we wait for another? So there's a great situation where Jesus is telling a friend, right? His cousin, the prophet that came before him and, and declared and paid the way. So even in that, he speaks in prophecy, right? He says, tell him what you've seen. You know, the lame walk, the, the, the deaf hear, the eyes, the blind see. The, this is, he's speaking in a way that's saying like revealing rather than just being like, yes. And when people say, well, why doesn't he, why isn't he clear? Or why the criticism later when they say, well, just speak plainly. I do think it's important for us because I think that's a common criticism of Christianity and even for people like people who are following Jesus of why doesn't God just tell me what he wants me to do? Why doesn't he just make the Bible clearer? Why are there these hard passages? And I just, it's important for us to remember that it's a, 
it's a false line of thinking. It's a logical fallacy to think that if God is direct and clear in a way that is very simple for us to understand that we would then believe him. Mm -hmm. Because for example, when people say, well, why doesn't God just come down and show us? Like, well, he did, he did. And, and made it really clear. And I don't know how much clearer you can make it than becoming flesh, performing all these miracles and then raising from the dead and then ascending into heaven feels, you know, you know, why doesn't God do these miracles? He did. And he does around the world right now. It's, but we, um, we, there's just no depth to our stubbornness of heart to not, to not see what we don't want to see or to, to see what, what's there, right? Like, so we, we tend to, we see what we want to see. Basically we see what makes sense to us, which is why all the time people just talk about relying on common sense. And we rely on like, we, we lean on our own understanding all the time. And in order to really believe and see who God is, we have to not rely on our own understanding. We have to, at some point, trust him and say, you know better than I do. Like your, the reality of you is bigger than my ability to comprehend everything. And ultimately that comes down to the reason why I want to be able to comprehend everything is because that gives me a semblance of control, semblance of autonomy, semblance of feeling like I did this rather than receiving it. And therein lies the biggest, I think the biggest issue with us. Yeah. And, and you know, because the issue may initially be like cognitive, like a, like a needing information. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, but the truth is for every one of us who follows Jesus as a disciple, um, that bridge that just like, who is he? We cross that, uh, pretty quickly. But the, the other, the other part of it where we have to submit and really when, once you become a disciple, it doesn't feel like you have to submit. It's, it feels like I get to submit. He's my Lord. And that is, that is the way of life. But that point of turning from self and, and really like submitting that is not cognitive. That's not a issue of information. And that's, what's so I think challenging, you know, about following him and why his grace is required to trust him because there isn't a human being who evaluates him from a neutral point of view, right? We all come and not, and it's not even from a positive point of view, right? We all come from a place of brokenness that is predisposed to want to dismiss anyone who will be over us, right? And to find reason to not follow them. And you can see it play out with human leaders all the time, right? It's just the way of the world. But this is so much more absolute, right? This is someone who um, claims to be your creator and who you owe everything to for making you and who you're in rebellion to. So yeah, the we don't come to this information just as a uh, kind of a bystander. We already have a horse in the race. I think that's the way we would say that. And they did. I mean, you can see how they respond to him. They did. And sometimes it feels like they're intentionally being obtuse because they don't want, they don't want to, they don't want to know this. This is information that's offensive to them. And I like that you pointed out, it's not just offensive theologically, it's offensive socially. It's offensive. It's a threat to power. It's a threat to all the prestige that went with power for them. It would mean that they aren't king, (laughs) that he is. And, and you're right. Like Rome Rome would not have cared. No. He, you know, unless he, unless he gained a large enough following because Caesar was Lord and they all knew that Caesar's right. Lord. But I don't, I don't know. I don't think that Caesar ever said I am. I don't think that was a thing that, that it was no. in a Roman consciousness. No. That was a, a Jewish way of um, God revealing himself. But yeah, I think that's important for today. The, the idea that no one, when we are sharing the gospel, when we are, we are articulating truths about Jesus that, that we've won a hearing for with our life, people do not hear that from a neutral place. They don't. And we need to not be surprised at that. That's just the state of the world. And it's why we are people of prayer and why prayer was this last week in family Bible lab, the verse that we looked at together, I loved the conversation around it was the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And Jesus instructs his disciples, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Like he always is linking prayer with the mission of God because it can't be accomplished with human means because the heart is so hard and in rebellion. Right. Which is why all of these, 
all these things that we look at and say, well, God, why don't you just make this clear? Why don't you just do this? It, it's because faith is being dependent on him. And we've said this before, but if, if God just listed out, hey, here's all the things I want you to do, and here's all the things I want you to believe. Like if the Bible was actually organized like our church's statement of faith, here are the 10 things you should believe, then the 10 commandments, whatever, and, and just explained out. Um, first of all, it would never be able to be exhaustive enough to cover every situation, every circumstance. But secondly, you'd have no need for dependency on the Holy Spirit. Like if everything made sense. And then, and then thirdly, it's so weird to me, the idea that we think we should be able to understand everything that anyone, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're an atheist or agnostic or whatever, we all, there's no way any of us could look around the world and say, oh, well, I'm probably at the peak of this pyramid. Like me personally, I should be able to understand everything about how this world works. That's, that's, that's uh, just an outrageous claim that I would be able to understand everything. And so often, so often people discredit God or discredit the Bible purely based on the fact that it doesn't fully make sense to them. And I'm like, does it fully make sense to you how an airplane can fly? Like I just flew and I don't even know how many tons that airplane is and it has no feathers and those wings don't flap. I like, it's, it's wild to me. I do not fully understand it, but that doesn't mean like, well, I just don't believe it can fly. Like, well, I know it can, I've seen it, but I don't understand it. So there's lots of areas of our life. Like we, that we accept things on faith that we know, okay, I believe, um, you know, like when I go, if I go to the pharmacist, I don't understand what all goes into the medicine that they might give me. I'm totally going on faith that that they that whoever put it together knows what they're doing. I don't understand it. So lots of ways that we that we understand that we we shouldn't be able to understand everything. But then when it comes to the God of the universe and it comes to his word that he's revealed over thousands of years, we think like, well, it doesn't make sense to me. So therefore it doesn't exist. Like, wow, do we realize like you said that's almost intentionally obtuse. And I think all of us know what it's like to be in that situation. I don't know if there's anybody that doesn't know the experience of being in some kind of argument where you realize you have that moment where you realize, Oh, I'm wrong. And you still double down or you, you, you say something along the lines of, well, it's just a misunderstanding or a miscommunication. Well, we probably both did things or whatever, but there's a voice in your head. That's like, nah, it's pretty much on you. Like you totally misunderstood that, misread that, misremembered, or you just had the wrong information. Um, so we all know what that's like. And so that is, that's kind of what's happening here, that when we are trying to protect our own world, we will, we will go to great lengths to intentionally be obtuse. And it's actually pretty silly. That's why when I did the defenses, why I kind of put them in playground terms because I, I kind of wanted to reveal the, like, it may sound like they're being theological, but essentially they're saying, nah, and then what I didn't say in this, the second one of like, um, oh, what was the, when I said there, there was the nah, and then, um, oh, the, the second one was like the tribalism. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't say, do you oh. know who I am? Oh, do you know who I am? Yeah. That the, the other one that was in, in that, that I didn't end up saying was, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> it's like when Jesus says you're a son of the devil, or they essentially say like, no, you're a demon. Like that's yep. the classic. I know you are, but what am I? And, and so that's ultimately what they boil down to. They can couch them in theological terms. They can make themselves look like they're religious and they know what they're doing and what they're talking about. But at the end, when you boil it down, you're like, you're basically, you're basically a stubborn 10 year old that's on the playground having an argument. And you're saying, nah, or like, I know you are, but what am I? And it's so silly, but that's what we do on a, like we are constantly doing that to God. And that's the equivalent of our, our arguments. 
not realizing that what we're really doing is deflecting from the cost of what, what, what will it cost if I actually believe this? If I believe that you are, that the kingdom is a treasure hidden in a field, so I'm going to invest everything in it. Like there's a cost to that. There's, there's always a cost. And if we aren't okay with the cost, we will try to protect whatever it is we want to protect. We're willing to give up some things, but other things we're going to protect and we'll couch it in religious terms. And we just don't, we don't want to do that. We at least want to be like the first step of dealing with that is just be honest about that and just saying, man, I'm afraid. I love it when people say, I'm afraid that if I start going down this road, that God's going to call me to move or give up this or whatever. Like I'm afraid of that. Like I always look at that and go, that's a great first step, like to acknowledge that that's what that is, rather than starting with the, well, but I know God's never going to ask me to do this because this thing over here is good. But what then you're saying is, this is the part of my kingdom I'm not going to let go of. To get to a place where you say, I'm afraid God's going to ask this of me, is acknowledging the, because the only reason you'd be afraid that he's going to ask something of you is that you are saying that you would want to obey him. In this. Yes. It's the reason underneath the reasons. You know, and your I like your your airplane example a couple minutes ago made me think of that's such a good example of how complex knowledge is for us as humans. So, so I don't know if you've had friends that are uneasy flyers. Um, I when I first started flying, I, I, was, I was uneasy. An uneasy flyer, yeah, and actually, it did help to to read about how lift works and how planes are designed. Yeah, the wing is supposed to move a little bit. That's not like coming off. So that actually does help. But I have a lot of friends that have like learned a lot about how flight works and they still feel really uneasy. So they have intellectual knowledge. They could explain to you while they're flying. Yeah, this is what's going on. And that, that helped, but they still feel totally uneasy. And there's a level like that's illustrating that you could learn, you could learn all these things about Jesus and even believe they're true, but you were still going to be in a place of needing to trust. There's still a level at which as a human being, just having information in our head is not enough. There's a, there's a step you take. And so the person who knows everything about how flight works, you know, to the best of our human ability and still feels like this is not going to work (laughs) is illustrating. Like it's not just enough to know more stuff. When we, when we start to follow Jesus, like you just said, the reason that we're, we might be afraid is we realize to obey him is going to cost. It's going, it's going to require us to learn a, a whole new way of being that might, that might mean we have to give up some things that we really have grown accustomed to and that are the normal way we live now. But it's surely a lot more than just knowing things. It's a lot more than being able to answer questions about who he is. It's something deeper in the human heart. And that's why knowledge is never, even biblically, when Jesus says to know God is eternal life and the one he has sent, it's not just talking about information. It's relational. It is. Well, you, you just hit it. It's so funny that you said that about learning how airplanes work. So I also was uneasy, but learning about how airplanes work was not even at all what was interesting no, to me. Didn't help at all. No, I didn't even care. Like I wouldn't even want to know <laughs> like what I cared about. Cause I'm, it's just the different wiring. So you're a learner. You're yes. like, you like to learn how do things work? I'm a numbers guy a lot of times. So what helped me was statistics. And you know, that when they talk about the statistics yeah. of flying, like you're far more likely to you know, the way more likely to get into a car accident than you are in a plane crash. And I always used to say, yeah, but your survival rate in a car accident is much higher than a plane, plane crash. But you don't have to say those things, Jay, that might be, that might affect some people too too far. (laughs) I think I, well, so like the point being that, that I love what you said there though, about information, information is meant to serve faith. It doesn't Mm -hmm. bring faith. It doesn't create faith. So same thing happens with apologetics. I mean, there are incredible historical arguments for, for example, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's really fascinating to look at historical documents that were not Christian, like Josephus and others that, that like most historians agree, like Jesus lived. Like it's actually a, it's a really fringe argument that, that Jesus was just this myth that didn't exist. Like secular historians say like, no, this, this dude lived. Everybody pretty much agrees he was crucified. Like that, that is historically, um, accounted for. 
Um, it's just fascinating. And so then there's incredible evidences for the resurrection. Cause I mean, that's what it all hinges on. Um, there's incredible information and arguments, logical scientific arguments for the trustworthiness of God's word, like how it's been preserved and how, when you find every time they find like older texts or older transcripts, they just verify like the authenticity. Like you never find like, Oh my goodness, this the entire second half of John, like we found this thing and it's just not even the same thing. It's, it's always like, it's so high. It's like 98%. I forget what it was or whatever. And then like the differences are like a comma here or a period here. This thing was capitalized and it wasn't capitalized in this text. So it's really amazing. But none of those things can give faith. What they can do is encourage a faith that is there. So when, so it's God's kindness that he gives us those, those things, because it's, it can help you when, when you believe and and it, it can bolster and encourage, it can encourage your faith. Does that make, does that make sense? And I think a lot of times we lean on those things and we think that like, well, like when sharing the gospel, we think, well, if I had the right answer to that question, then they'd be convinced. And I always want to tell people, no, they're not. Like Jesus himself could stand right in front of them and give them the direct answer for their question. If they don't believe that he is from God and they don't hear his voice, then they're, they won't believe him. And I, I love that that's captured in, in the gospels too. Yeah. When, when Thomas doubted. Right. And it, it's just amazing to me that those are actually pretty embarrassing moments, right? If you're, if you're the leader of a movement to have some of the people closest to you really Thomas. doubting and, but, but that was really how it went. And and we're able to see like how faith works through those examples. And even early on in the gospels, when um, people were, were doubting and, and the response was, why don't you come and see for yourself, see him for yourself. And then you decide, right. You know, and I think that's one of the, one of my desires is to help people that don't know him get the opportunity to get glimpses of who he is and his word and, and reading the gospels with, with them can be a way of doing that to remove some of those layers, you know, cultural later layers that we put on top of it. Yeah. You're right though. I mean, apologetics, mo- most of you know, I spent like 13 years on university campuses min- being a minister of the gospel. Yeah. And I found very rarely w- was, was someone's hang up, you know, in that environment, right. An environment of learning and skepticism. Very rarely was it that they needed to hear the Kalam cosmological argument from me. Very rarely did they need to hear the moral argument for God's existence that might be something that can get a convert, like get you a, you know, earn a hearing is what I would say. Like, Oh, well, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before, but really in the end, it comes down to something much more relational and personal that a person needs to hear. Right. You have to, you're right. Like I think I found that those kinds of arguments and those kinds of discussions when done respectfully can open doors and can maybe break down some barriers. But what we often want to talk about when we talk about evangelism is you're, you're giving somebody words that can explain what the Holy spirit is doing inside of them. So think about like you go to the doctor and you say, you know, my shoulder hurts and like every time I move it this way. And so then the doctor says, Oh, so when you move it this way, does it hurt? Like, yeah, that hurts really badly right there. Okay. And then they show me a diagram and they say like, so this muscle is torn. It looks like this muscle is torn and that would, that would make this happen and this happen. Well, I believe him that my muscle is torn because of the pain. I'm like, cause of what's happening inside my body and it's describing what's happening. I didn't know what was happening in there, but now that he's describing it, I'm like, Oh, that's connecting evangelism is a similar way. Like uh, when you are sharing the gospel with somebody, if the Holy spirit is working in them and opening their eyes, something's happening into them that they don't understand. They feel a conviction that they've never felt before. They feel a sense of anticipation or excitement that they've never felt before. They see something and are starting to understand something they've never understood before. And then you come along and you give words to that and say, well, that's because God, God created you and we've rebelled against him. That's why our world is broken. And that's why our lives pursuing our own kingdoms doesn't work. But then he sends Jesus to reconcile us, to, to turn us back to God, that we would turn from our rebellion and turn to him. You start declaring that if that's what's going on, the person that responds to that is saying, yes, 
that's what's hap- that's what's happening. That's very different than a person who is hardened in heart. They're not intellectually going, oh, that makes sense. Therefore, I'm going to believe. Right. And so that'd be like me going to the doctor and him saying your shoulder, this muscle is torn. And I'm like, none of those things that you're saying are my experiences in my body. Like none of those things are happening. So no, I don't, I'm not worried about that. It's the same reason why you, it's impossible to tell a 20 year old, Hey, you should eat healthy. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You can't tell a 20 year old that they need to eat healthy because they can pack away ridiculous amounts of food. Their body just burns it all up. Grease, fat, sugar, like, you know, I have a 17 year old, he can eat whatever he wants. And so it's impossible to convince him the importance of eating healthy. Now, when you're 40, six, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, hey, when you eat this, you feel gross. You feel like you have no energy. You're like, yeah, yeah, I'm experiencing all that. Okay. So now the evangelism of healthy eating Mm -hmm. connects because something's going on inside of me that that makes sense of like, Hey, do you feel, do you feel like you're crashing at one thirty in the afternoon? Like those are the kinds of things that hook us, right? Because you're yes. like, yes, I am crashing at one thirty. now. I don't have as much energy. Oh, it's because of this. When I was 18 and they said like, do you feel like you don't have enough energy? Like, I don't know. I have energy whenever I want it. It doesn't register as a need. It doesn't right. attach to any desire. It doesn't attach to a desire, an experience or whatever. And so what, so to kind of tie a bow on that, I just hope that this would be encouraging people of when you're sharing the gospel, if the Holy Spirit is doing something in that person, then the simplest of presentations are going to make sense to them and are going to spark their desire and their interest when given in gentleness and respect and love. Mm -hmm. But if the person is not, if the Holy Spirit's not doing anything in them, then no answer you can give them about dinosaurs or about the problem of pain or about anything is going to mean anything. Now it might plant to see, it might, it, it may still be valuable to share that. And they go, Oh, that's interesting. And you say, okay, but it's there somewhere so that when it, you know, you want to share things that if the Holy spirit awakens them and starts that you've given them some words that make sense of what's going on inside of them. Yeah. And you've said it a couple of times now, but it, it, you know, the way you do that is, um, the way you do that is so important with gentleness and respect and love. And it's interesting how, you know, when you're eager for someone you love to know Jesus and you do share and it feels like it's having no impact, it can be tempting to want to really double down and to not do it in gentleness and respect, but to be very forceful. Right. Because we want to control it. We want, yeah. And but that's kind of, it the, it's kind of the equivalent though, of like if someone walked in the church today and they were, they were speaking Mandarin and, you know, you and I don't speak Mandarin and our, our, like in our desire to communicate and help them, we just started to say English words loudly, loudly and more angry. Yeah. As if, <laughs> as if that makes them hear and that doesn't, mm-hmm. right. It's like, it's it, and that's kind of an instinct that we have, but I, I really do think if we're speaking a language of the kingdom of God, to people, um, saying it loudly and saying it aggressively, isn't going to give them hear, ears to hear it. In fact, they're probably just going to move on. Like imagine the person, the Mandarin speaker, they're like, oh, this guy's not going to help me. He thinks saying it loudly. <laughs> it's right. It's not going to help. It's making it worse. So I, I think <laughs> it's amazing how Jesus, you see it in him. You see him. He's not harsh with the, with the skeptic. He's not harsh with the seeker. It's, it's the prideful um, religious people that get their rebuke from him. Um, and, and then we're instructed very clearly by Paul, you know, to do so in gentleness and respect because that has a lot more to do with us in those moments than, than what we're trying to communicate anyways. If we get angry or frustrated, it's not really about that person at that point. No. And I think that's a great illustration. I had a different illustration, but yours is better. So I love that with the language and that, yeah, yelling at it. I, when I teach evangelism at the seminary, I, one of the things that I say is that you want to share in such a way that if the Holy Spirit ever awakens their heart, that they would think of you as a person who both a could help them understand what's going on and a person that they would want to have help them understand what's going on. Right. So going back to the, the doctor situation, you know, or, or telling someone to eat healthy. Well, 
you want if if somebody said to me like hey i think it's important you may notice someday that your energy's like dipping or whatever i'd love to help you with that well that's a person that if i start noticing that i'd want to i'd say oh i'd like to go talk to jeff jeff mentioned this to me and i think he knows what he's talking about and i i want i'm drawn to want to ask him versus if somebody was like someone just walked up to me at Burger King and like, what are you filling yourself with that kind of junk? That's going to destroy you. Well, I don't want to go to that person. Even if later I'm like, oh, I don't feel so good. I'm not, I don't have any interest in going to that person. I don't trust them. And so rather than trying to convince people, um, kind of establishing, just saying, like declaring God's goodness and, and making it clear, like, Hey, I follow Jesus. And so that, so that they would think of you as a person of that's a person who has been with Jesus. And that's a person that I'm drawn to that. I would like, like that, that I'd like to have them help explain what, what I'm experiencing. Right. And that's so critical. And yeah, I just, that when you, the, the phrase that this person has been with Jesus, that to me, that's when, one of the things we need to just be praying that we would, that we would kind of reek of him in, in, in a good way that it would be evident that we have been with him. And it also underscores for me personally, just the need to be with him, to be conscious of being with him and intentional about being with him because we aren't going to be, you can't fake that Mm -hmm. (laughs) people can, especially people who, um, maybe like kind of looking in from the outside can tell genuine, a genuine heart and a genuine love for him versus a, a religious, um, show it's really obvious. And it, to me, it's an encouragement because when, when God puts his spirit in us, we have, we can have confidence that he's at work in us and that we can connect with him in real tangible ways, um, in our just normal lives so that it's evident to people that, that we've been with him. And that doesn't mean that because the only words that come out of our mouth are Bible verses, right? It's not because no. we lead the conversation with, did you notice I have a Bible in my hand? It's, <laughs> It's because we embody the ways of Jesus and it's just obvious. Something's different. Have you ever, <laughs> I was going to say the, old, we grew up with the WWJD yeah, we bracelets did. and yep. the t-shirts, all the Christian t-shirts and you know, they, you had to let people know and make it clear. And there's, there's a lot of, a lot of cringiness in that, but it's also a bare, it, it, it's worth pointing out that the only time Jesus gets combative and kind of argumentative are in these situations with religious people. So it like, it does seem that I, I think that there is, if we ever ask like, is there a time and a place to, to, for example, debate or to call things out? And the, the common denominator that I see in the gospels is that when it's with people who are putting themselves as a religious authority and then leading people astray or creating a stumbling block to God or building up walls to God. That's, that's where we're called to, to call things out. And, and so it's always silly to me when you're like this, this person, like, why, why am I calling out this atheist over here? Like, that's not like, but the, the pastor who's proclaiming a, a works gospel, you know, or, um, something that's a false gospel and it confuses people. And so it might confuse God's sheep and, and lead them astray. That's, that's when we're supposed to, you know, be a little more, I think, assertive. And that's what we see in Jesus. And I want to follow that. Um, and so when people say like, well, so then we just, we just let these things go. I'm like, well, it depends. Are we talking about in the church? Or are we talking about outside of the church? Um, you know, we face that all the time. Like there are, people don't realize, you know, like we have our library and we try to curate that. Like we try to make sure that it's helpful. It's not all people that agree with us on everything. It's not, it's not just like, Oh, here are the people that we agree with completely, but they're people that we would say, we think these are helpful authors, um, or pastors. But if in the past I've had this, like when we were in Colorado and I could see it happening here at times where if you see influence coming into the church, that, that is, pulling people away in a certain direction, well, then I would, I would call something out or someone out if I felt like they, but I'm not going to just randomly call out random people that aren't having any influence. It's, it's what's in front of you in that moment. And so that's, I I only say that as the caveat to say, well, then 
you know, is the answer that we're always supposed to just be gentle and non-confrontational, whatever. And I would say with those outside of the church, yeah, like pretty much like almost exclusively you see that. But if you're going to talk about in front of people who are um, posturing themselves as a religious authority, but keeping people from God, well, then there's a little different, little different strategy than at that point. Hmm. Yeah, those are those are good thoughts, Jay. I'm, <laughs> Do you, you know, I'm so, just Jeff? yeah, I'm just processing what you the just said. The confrontational. I know that you, like you're you're not as wired for confrontation, but I've seen you be confrontational. Oh, I, yeah, you're I willing mean, to be confrontational. The, yeah, definitely. And I I think with that with that scenario, I mean, the the thought I was having there, just kind of thinking for a second, was yeah, because there's a lot at stake, right? With that, and and leading God's people astray is is very different. Um. So, you know, I had a question too, like, unless you had more on that topic. No. Okay. You know, sometimes we talk about things that, that didn't fit into the sermon. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. So there might be, you might have nothing, but I'm curious if there were, if there were any, you know, things you just didn't have time for either in the moment or, uh, when you're prepping, I know that this, this I am statement, you know, it didn't lend itself as, as easily as some as the other ones will to like it's obviously this is the application, right? It's wasn't quite as, as that way. So I was just curious if, if there were things that you didn't have time for that, that kind of got the chopping Dude, block. So, so anything many you want to share? <laughs> this was, I, I would say that this passage is one of the hardest ones to, that I've preached in a long time, as far as just trying to organize one is be just because John is not very linear. Right. So John just writes in a way that is always challenging to kind of summarize and pull out like, okay, here's the key, here's the key thoughts. But then when you're talking about this statement, it's, it's not a clear, you know, like if you go into first Timothy, Paul, like pretty much everything is Paul's basically writing all these sermon outlines. You just, you have sermon outlines all over the place, not in John and not with the I am statements, but you're right. The, the advantage of the other ones, the metaphorical statements that we'll be going over the next seven weeks, it's very clear this is the metaphorical statement. And so the sermon structure is going to be basically like, what does he mean by this? Yes. And how do we apply this to our lives and, and, and receive Christ as this, that he says he is. So when he says, I am the vine, what is that? What does he mean by that? And how do we experience him being the vine? It's going to be, you know, bread of life, all these, um, but this one is just like this emphatic, you know, absolute statement. And so I really then got that down to, that's why it came down to, okay, well, do you receive that statement? Cause that's ultimately what he's doing when he says that, you know, he's, he's saying I've come to set you free, but they don't, they don't want to be set free because they don't, they don't see themselves as enslaved because they don't trust, they don't. They don't see Jesus as the Messiah. They and so if you don't see him as the Messiah, it doesn't matter what he's offering. Like if you don't trust the person, like if you were if you if you were at Walmart and somebody told you, I've hey, if you come out to my van, I've got a million dollars for you, you're not going out to the van. Not because you don't want a million dollars or that you wouldn't receive a million dollars if someone was going to give you a million dollars, but because you don't believe him. You think that dude's either crazy or he's wanting to hurt me. And so ultimately, when we do make it about all these other things, like, well, I need God to explain why did this hard thing happen to me when I was, you know, younger, or I need him to explain what's going on over here, or I need him to explain dinosaurs, or I need to understand this, or whatever. Ultimately, it comes down to who do you say he is? Like, is Jesus the Christ? If he is then whatever his answer for dinosaurs is, I'm, I'm on board with, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't need full explanation of that. If he's not, then I also don't care what his answer about dinosaurs is like either way or the problem of evil and pain. If, if Jesus actually lived this life and died this death, taking on my sin and exchanging it for righteousness and then rose from the grave, then I'm going to be okay with the fact that I don't understand all the suffering in the world but that he says he's going to make it all right. I'm going to trust him in that. If I think he is lying about that, 
then it really doesn't matter what his philosophical defense is of evil because I don't, I, I'm not going to trust him in it anyway. Like what, what that's C.S. Lewis. So that was part of, I guess, part of what I left out was C.S. Lewis's, um, deal of liar, lunatic or Lord, which he just, he made popular. He didn't, he didn't create it. It's been going around for a long, lot longer than C.S. Lewis, but, um, but yeah, his, just that clear idea of with what Jesus claimed in John eight and in other places, but John eight is a very clear, um, statement that when he makes that claim, he's either lying. So he's, he's a, a con artist, a grifter, or he is out of his mind. He's a, he's a lunatic. He, he has some kind of Messiah complex and thinks he's somebody, which we've seen people in the world of both of those. We've seen, you know, grifters who use religion to scam people. We've seen those that think that they are the Messiah because they are out of their mind. And C.S. Lewis says he, he's either that or he is actually who he says he is. He's, he's the Lord. And, and there's not any, and what he's trying to do in that is to get it out of this idea of just saying like, well, Jesus is a good teacher. And Mm -hmm. so people who would follow his moral teachings or think that he has some really interesting things to say about whatever. And and C.S. Lewis is like, that's just nonsense. You can't, once he claims to be God, that all that gets like thrown out the window, right? Like now, now you're saying like, oh, that's when you start getting the weird things when people, you know, you remember the, the Cincinnati Reds owner, um, Marge shot. No. So the nineties, <laughs> she came under fire. And I think she basically, like she was early getting canceled. If you got canceled in the nineties, okay, that's a doozy. Like, right. That was not easy to get canceled. People were like, bah, whatever. But she came out and she said that Hitler did a lot of good things. Oh gosh. You know, he built infrastructure or whatever. And like, we always focus on the bad things, but he did a lot of good things. And you're like, okay. On one hand, yes, he built roads, right? There are some things that actually, but you don't say that because the dude was an evil monster who murdered millions of people. So therefore we don't like, if you want to talk about a public servant that built good infrastructure, you don't use him anymore. You use somebody else. So similarly, like with Jesus, if he's out of his mind or he's a grifter and a con man, you don't, you don't quote him quote, quote Gandhi, then quote Buddha. Like, the, the whatever the moral teachings that you're pulling out from Jesus, you can find other philosophies in the world that might teach any of those in a vacuum. The gospel narrative is unique in in all the world, and so that's what we focus on the 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 life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins and reconciliation to God is completely unique. But he, the like you know, if you want to talk about loving your enemies or being kind to people or you know. The, those kinds of things are found other places. So find a, find some other moral teacher, but Jesus claims to be God. So you can't, you know, so I know you pulled up the C.S. Lewis quote. Yeah. Can I read it? Yeah, I think it, it. C.S. Lewis just, he says it. He probably said it better. Well, better than anybody, right? <laughs> Not just you and me, <laughs> but he said this on the radio originally, right? right? This was yeah. a, this was on the BBC. So here's the quote from mere Christianity. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So that, that's how you get remembered as a writer. <laughs> it's like, oh my. And that last line. Yeah. He has not left that open to us. No. He did not. It's not. That's not an option, and so I think that, yeah, what a what an incredible statement, and that's and ultimately that's the reality. That's why explaining and having all the answers ultimately doesn't it doesn't do anything 
to convince somebody or to give them faith because at the end of the day, everyone has to look at Jesus and say, that's the question. Who do you say that he is? And he does not leave open the option that he's a life coach or a good moral teacher or a deliverer of some principles that will make your marriage better, make your, um, make your business more successful, make your life easier. It's, he is either Lord or he is, he is something far worse. Like he's, he's out of his mind or I love how C.S. Lewis said that or something worse Mm -hmm. because that is the worst. Like the liar part is the worst part. Like the person that is just delusional, you're like, okay, well they're sick and they, um, but, but there are worse things. And that's someone that would intentionally, uh, mislead people. And you think about what the disciples, how, what their lives looked like after, after Jesus ascends into heaven, nobody would, nobody would choose the life that they had unless they believed in the kingdom. Like unless they believed in what Jesus was offering them and they, it it was worth it. Like it wasn't even, and, and what's fascinating about that is they didn't do it begrudgingly. They did it full of joy. So how, how great is what Jesus was offering them and how deeply did they believe that what he was offering that they with joy, like they rejoiced when they suffered because they counted, they counted it joy that they could suffer for his namesake. Like they, they were like, <laughs> they were, they were bulletproof, man. They were just, and that's, that's what we want to be. And we want to be that in Christ because we look at him and we say, you are Lord. And that's probably the, the, for me anyway, the punctuation point on that is we're talking about this, like the cost of following him, the cost of believing him, what you have to lay down, like in order to be set free, you actually have to give up your control, which is feels like paradoxical. But when we say that, we also have to remember that he is good. Like it's not, it's not a, Oh, okay. Yeah. I probably should give up all this because Jesus died for me. So therefore I'm supposed to live this joyless life. No, we'll, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. Like he came for, to give us abundant life. It's, it's better. And that's why the early church had so much joy. And that's why if you know people, like we all know people who are following Jesus, who just experience this deep joy. That's, that's when, you know, that's why Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit, because that's what will come out of it. When you, when you really do, when you look at him and you say, you are Lord. And, um, so hopefully that's, hopefully that's encouraging. But I just, I love that line if he didn't leave that option no. open to us. So we should not create options and categories that Jesus didn't give us. No. Yeah. He, he's far less threatening if he's just a moral teacher that you can decide whether or not what he's saying yeah. fits in your life. Right. He's not doing that though. Yeah. He's, he's much more um, absolute. Like he said, he is, I am. So did, did we get all the rust off, Jay? I don't, know, do you think? I don't we, know. We were, I, well, we'll we got some, some feedback. There's definitely some rust, <laughs> but we figured it out. We did. All right. Thanks for hanging in there with us. We uh, hope that this has been helpful as always. Please reach out to us. Um, we would love to help you get connected. If you are new to our church family, uh, we relationships is what we're, what we're about and we need to get you connected with people. So, um, so reach out to us. You can email us at connect at faithpeshtigo.com or talk to us on a Sunday um, while we're here. And um, yeah, talk about rust. Landing the plane is the rusty part. So you got it. We hope it's been helpful. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Until next time, grace and peace. Mm-hmm.